Ed Ilgenfritz, United States Army, Korea. Ed served with the 25th Division as an artilleryman from Thanksgiving 1951 to March of 1953, 16 months in combat. And he has a gripping story, folks, of the cold, which took as many people as the enemy fire and the Chinese and the North Koreans. It's this amazing story that Ed tells about Korea, the Forgotten War. Ed is one of the few veterans I really got to know personally as a friend, him and his wife Joan. He passed away at 92 in January of this year and his wife died nine days later. So it was one of those marriages made in heaven. I'm happy to present this story to you and I'd like to thank Brandon Glidden for sponsoring this story. Brandon, you're a patriot. Thank you for your love for these veterans, for these Korea veterans, so that we don't forget. Korea, the Forgotten War. Amen. Okay, folks, if you'd like to sponsor one of these videos, I know a lot of you have been blessed and touched by these stories. I would ask that you please contact me. There's information in the video description and in the comment section. Would love to have you become a sponsor and take ownership in these stories. Like I say, you've been touched or blessed. And folks, these are stories that need to be heard today. You know, I've spent 20 years of my life interviewing these veterans. It's a labor of love. I love my work. And now I need your help to get these stories out there. I've got many, many stories archived. And I, I want to really thank those that are helping make these stories come to pass. Okay. March 8, 2007, Abington, Maryland. I interviewed Ed Ilgenfritz. I present his story to you now in the Voices of History channel. Share it with a friend. Subscribe to this channel. And let's keep this thing going, folks. God bless you. I think the first thing I want to know is what year did you join the military? 1951. 51. 51. And Army? Army. Okay. Did you, did you feel a real sense of duty to serve your country then? Uh, I'll tell you, I was playing ball for the Crown Court Conceal, and I couldn't get a promotion. Therefore, I sat down with about five men, on five boys on our front porch and I said let us go down and join the Navy down at uh, Fort McHenry mm -hmm. and what happened was we went down five of us went down we went through the line and when I had my eyes checked the fellow put his hand on my shoulder and he said we can't use you because you have split vision in your left eye I said okay fine I dressed went outside. All the other fellows came out. They said, we have to report down here next Tuesday. I said, I don't. And I was the one who convinced them to go. Therefore, what happened was that they almost, Charlie Jackson almost made me walk home. <laughs> but three weeks later, I received a draft notice. And I said, all right, I'll go down to Water Street. I said, that's going to be no problem. I said, Mom, I'll be home, no, no problem. So I went down to Water Street, and they examined me. They checked my eyes, and uh, the fellow put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, that's all right, son, we'll give you two pair of glasses. Next thing you know, I raised my right hand, stood up with everybody else, took my step forward, swore my allegiance to the, to the country, and I was on a bus going to Fort Meade. Uh, from now, you went in in 1951. Yeah. Okay. Were you trained to be an artilleryman? Is that what you did? You yeah. You were an artillery? Right. C can, you, can you tell me, we're going to kind of skip around here okay. a little bit, but tell me about when you went to Korea and, and what, what you first thought about being in country. Was it what you thought it was going to be and, and where you were when you first went to Korea? All right. We went over on the Marine links. We stopped at Camp Drake, we zeroed in our weapons, we were then put back on the ship, and we went around to, and we went around to Pusan. Uh, we went over the, over the side of the ship, we were trained to go on rope ladders and things like that. We went over the side of the ship, 
we got into landing barges, and we had an 80-pound pack on our back, mm -hmm. and a couple of guys fell off, went into the water. They, that was my first experience of seeing people die. And we were, went to shore. We were then met, and it was very orderly. We were met, and we were divided into where we, we got off the landing barge exactly the way we, that we, we were trained. All right. And prior to, prior to that, uh, on the trip around to get there, uh, the chaplains opened up for communion for everybody who wanted communion. It was crowded 24 hours a day. We landed on shore. We were divided into our units. With what units we were, I was a replacement. And what happened was, was the fact that I was supposed to be an artillery mechanic right, or a turret mechanic for tanks. I drove tanks. I also worked on 105s, 155s, and so forth. So what happened was, was the fact that the uh, artillery mechanic for the triple nickel artillery, he was killed. And uh, so I became a replacement for him on a, like a TDY thing. Only I became permanent, <laughs> permanent there. So uh, therefore, we were put in trucks, we went north, and uh, I was put with the unit. So you're, you're in North Korea or South Korea? We were in South Korea at that time. Okay, and you're fighting the Chinese? Chinese, so we were going north. Okay, t t walk t t w you're a young man, it's his first time in combat. Yes. Okay, and you're with what infantry division? Or the 25th Infantry Division. And your, your, your title is artillery? Artillery mechanic. Okay, and what, what's your rank at that time? All right, my rank at that time, I was a PFC. Okay, so you're in an infantry unit. Um, you're, you're, tell me about the first time you remember engaging the enemy, where you were, and what type of combat you, you found yourself in. All right, we were scared to death. All of us. There wasn't anybody that wasn't scared. And it's better to be scared than not scared, I think. Well, what happened was, was we got, went up to the Nikon River, and it was there that the Chinese came across, all right? And there was also, there was a, there were, there was a bridge. There were Koreans that were evacuating, and we let them go. They had these white, clothes on, and we let them come, come across the bridge. Item number one, that was bad news, because they were infiltrators and they carried guns underneath of those white clothes, and they went behind us. So therefore, what happened was, was we were attacked at night from behind, as well as from, as well as from the front. We wound up blowing up the bridge and not letting anybody else come across. All right. So, uh, okay, so are you fighting the Chinese at this time? Or? Fighting the Chinese. W w tell me a little bit about the Chinese. What kind of enemy were they? Very aggressive. They came like flies. And if you put down barbed wire in front of you, they ran across the wire. The first wave hit the wire, the second wave ran across the guys that were holding the wire down. And you, you, they feel we were, you had seven bags of uh, powder to place in your canister when you went ahead and you, when you fired. We fired six a minute, which was totally wrong because we never even let the guns recoil all the way. So what happened was, was the fact that we were firing almost point blank. We were firing three, two, one bag. It was just dumping the 
shell across into the, into them. But we also we used machine guns and we also used rifles. And we didn't have too much time to, to dig parapets or anything like that. We just dug the gun trails in and we did the firing as fast as we could, as quick as we could. Uh, how, how accurate were the, was the shelling? Pretty good, pretty accurate? Yes, we hit them bad. But they hit us bad too. I mean, they, in numbers, it was numbers. That uh, they were overwhelming in numbers, screaming, hollering, uh, and everything like that. And, and, and you can hear all this from where you were at. Oh yes. Blowing bugles. Oh yes, blowing bugles, blowing bugles, making noise, screaming, yelling, and everything. They ca that's the way they came. Now, did you have infantrymen in front of you and tanks or anything or? Yes, we had the 5th Rock Division, which evacuated, and we became the infantry. All right, then that was bad news. And when Sergeant Wanatek, when our first sergeant said, fix bayonets on our rifles, we're artillery. Now, you can imagine when a, when the man says, fix bayonets, what goes through your mind? All right. And... And I had, I had a guy come over to parapet and I hung him on a bayonet. I mean, that, that's sad. You didn't know who you were fighting. It was, the idea was that the ones who survived, who lost the least amount of men won. And that was the whole thing. So somebody came over the pit and you bayoneted them with Chinese? Yeah. Or? Yeah. They were that close to you guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. They overran us. They overran us. At one time, we lost 13 out of 16 guns. We lost 45% uh, of our people. Well, why do you think you survived? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, re I really don't know. I was very fortunate. Uh, we, had a, we, we had very good officers, Converse, Captain Gatlin, uh, those men, they were from World War II. And Sergeant Wanatek, he was an old man. He was 45, and I'm 20. He's 45. All right, so he's an old man. We never retreated. We always made tactical withdrawals. All right, that's the way he put it. We're going to make a tactical withdrawal. So was this the first combat you had, you're telling me now, the first time you encountered the enemy, or is this just one of the worst ones? This, is, well, this is the first one. This is the first one. That's after three days. I'm there three. I'm there three days. And your friends are wounded or killed around you. Yes. Were you able to help them or? How yes. To, tell me yes. a story about helping somebody. What did you do? Yeah, we 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 picked them up. We gave them to the medics. We had the medics, and also one of the things that, that you have to realize is the fact that the medics were prime targets of the Chinese. They had an armband. If they had an arm band, they were shot. They, you know, even from far away, they they were they tried to they tried to kill them. We went ahead and we we did not want to lose anyone. As far as we were concerned, we were pick up as many people as we could, and we staked them out so the medics could pick them up. And also is the fact that. If you had an opportunity, if a fellow had an arm in bad, in bad shape, you put a tourniquet around him, you wrapped it up, and you left him there, and you staked him out with his rifle so that others could get him. Could, could get him. All right. It was a bloody mess. And it was an experience that you, you can never forget. Never. My wife went through 
Hades with me after we were married because of the fact that I would jump up at any, any noise or anything like that. And uh, also, I would want to almost hit the dirt if I heard a car backfire or something like that when I came home. So when you're in combat, is, is there a time as a young man that you feel like you're invincible, nothing can happen to me, and then they start shooting at you? And I've heard men say, we grew up fast. I mean, did you go through something like that where you felt like nothing can harm you and then you saw your friends get wounded or killed and reality set in? Well, you didn't realize what was going to happen. You fought and you didn't... You did not think at that time about dying right away. You didn't think about that time about dying. And you thought that we're going to make this and you and your, the ones who were with you you were their protector they were your protector, and you worked together. If they died, then you didn't have any protector. So you went ahead and you tried to protect them as much as they tried to protect you. A feeling of being invincible, you, where nobody was invincible. You knew that there was a possibility. You knew in your mind that there was a possibility that you were going to die. And how do you die? That's another thing. How do you die? And if you die, where do you go? At that time, were you a religious man? Did you pray? I mean, what got, oh, you, yes. what got you through those hard times? Your training, your faith in God? Well, faith in God, because of the fact that from the time it was small, I went to Sunday school, church, and everything like that. But uh, I never, I went to catechism in a Lutheran church, and uh, I went to two years of catechism. I was confirmed in the Lutheran church and everything else. But I was never given the plan of salvation until so Captain Smith came down to our battery and he gave us the plan of salvation. And it was then, on a snowy day, that I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us also something to read as he gave us small Bibles. And the one thing he gave us was Psalm 91. And he said, read that. Because we asked him, how do you die? Because we had so many who died. And he and his driver, Pete, were killed that day with incoming shells. We were getting really blasted by the Chinese again. And he came in, and, and he and Pete were killed both that day. And I'll never forget that. Did that scripture bring you some oh, yes. comfort? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. How about those around you? I mean, were they, was it organized chaos? Were, 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 were people doing their job even though all this bad stuff's happening? Were you able to focus on what you had to do? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah they had to. Because if you didn't, you were going to get killed. So what, what it is, is the fact that you had to, to survive. You did everything that you had to do to survive. It was survival. All right. Was it like this every day, or was it just every once in a while you encounter the Chinese? Or How long were you in Korea? A year? 18 months. Was it combat every day? Probably not. I mean, was it... Seven days a week. Is that right? Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Were you guys pushing up north? or what Pushing was north. Mm -hmm. 
were you driving them back? Push, it, push yes, we drove them back. We drove them back. And there were thousands. I mean, it was uh, literally. They came into the, they they came they came into the war. MacArthur. They came into the war. You know when, uh, when they had warned that they were going to come into the war. Uh, the intelligence said that there were seven hundred. There there were. Uh, a few thousand Chinese crossed across the Yale River when they got up that when they got up that far, but they didn't tell them it was three hundred fifty thousand, right? And you can imagine that we were overwhelmed. Then MacArthur they went around to Inchon and they went into Inchon and, and and then we we pushed north and we after after they had fallen back. Did you fight with the Marines at all, or the Marines uh, at another part of the of, of the area? The Marines were, all right. The Eighth Army and the Tenth Corps were split by the Chinese. The Tenth Corps, the Marines were in the Tenth Corps. We were in the Eighth Army, and uh, the Eighth, the uh, Marines were trapped at the at the Chosun Reservoir. All right. Oh. What is not known is that the 3rd Division, the 3rd Infantry Division, went in and helped get the Marines out of there. They came down what they called Bloody Alley. And they, they, came, they, they came down, they were on the left side or the, what you would call the west side of Korea. We were on toward the east side of Korea. And so what we did, we retreated and, well, we made tactical withdrawals to the sea and we were picked up by uh, LSDs and we went back down again and then came back on shore again. So, so what, um, what, what month did you go to Korea? What month and what year was it that you went to Korea? First okay, I, I got there on Thanksgiving of uh, 51. Okay, so tell me about how the cold affected your operations. We were in uh, 30 degrees below zero, 40 mile an hour winds, and we had to keep everything running. If we didn't keep anything running, uh, cars or the tanks or whatever vehicles you had, they froze up, they, everything, it was just tremendous. That the fact is that you did not, uh, the cold was so extreme that we were losing as many men to the cold, you know, as we were, we were getting shot. You couldn't lay down, you couldn't sleep, you couldn't do, any, you couldn't do anything. I was never so tired in my life. All right, and uh, we had no way. You had no way to wash. You had no way to clean yourself. You had no way to do, to, you know, to do things like that. The ground was as hard as a rock. Uh, to dig in was almost like impossible. Yeah, I do have. Uh, some pictures where we dug trenches, where we have an outpost, where Huffman and I are on an outpost. Now Huffman was a, uh, he lived on a ranch in Colorado, 50,000 acres. Can you imagine that? And he had a horse joker, uh, which he had in his pocket. <laughs> and his horse, you know, you would think of, a, you would think, would have a girlfriend or something like that, but he had his horse Joker in there, and he was very, uh, very strong, a very strong person, very, very strong, and uh, he did, he, he, he did, he did well. He took care of Louis Millard and several other guys who got wounded. He picked them up and carried them. So 
you're, you're there 18 months. It's You're going through the winter of 51. And 51 and 52. 52. And, and I came home in March of 53. So you're, you're encountering the Chinese all the way in, in this campaign. Um, what what t Tell me another incident about uh, uh, engaging the enemy where you were, or was it just the same thing, just a different location? I mean, Different just, location. It was the same scenario. You had the same scenario every time. Uh, it was uh, completely just... You did it the same way. How would the how would the riflemen shoot with the cold with their fingers? How would you do your work with your hands? Did you have gloves? Gloves, yes. Yeah. We had we we had we had gloves. You had parkas. Uh, not at first, no, because uh, they didn't think it was going to last that long, and uh, we had uh, summer clothes, and then what we did the second winter. That I was there, we had we had uh, parkas or we had uh, the the winter clothes. We had field jackets. What you did is you put layers on. You put as many layers on as you could, and uh, three months you, you didn't you didn't get any. You weren't cleaned up for three to four months at a time, and that was where you didn't have that where you just. Uh, there was a lull. All right. If there was a lull, you could then be evacuated back to a, an area where you could get yourself a shower. Now, it, you can imagine getting a shower in a tent with the temperature down, you know, at the, the, the degrees it was, and they had pipes, and the only thing you had for a shower was holes that were drilled in the pipes. So you got in under a trickle of water. You threw all your old clothes away. They gave you new clothes, and that's what and that's what you did. Now, uh, I was uh, evacuated on a helicopter, and uh, my friend Andy Husser tried to kill me. Uh, what happened was was I was we were being shelled pretty ha pr pretty bad and I was I was running and a shell came in and, and 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 landed and he pushed me all right meaning very good okay and I landed and I hit the gun trail with my chin they thought that I had been wounded but what happened was was my chin was bloody I had I, I, my chin was completely split open and whatnot. Uh, they had some helicopters come in to take the wounded out. I was in the second copter. The first copter was shot down. The second copter, I survived. I, I'm here today. So I went, I was evacuated, put in a mash hospital, they, and they uh, sewed me up. Very good. I had 55 to 60 stitches around my, around my chin. I was then great. I was evacuated to Japan for a week. And I was sent back. All right. I was sent back with a little bag. I had a, I, all, I had was, all I had was a little bag with some shaving stuff in it. Some shaving stuff in it. I got the sole, and there was nobody to pick me up. To take me to my unit, I had a far, I tried to find out where the unit was, mm -hmm. and I actually hitchhiked <laughs> back to back to my unit. Well, Ed, you saw a lot of combat over there. I mean, I'm just amazed by what you're telling me. Um, how how did that change you as a person, and even in later years, how did how did your experience in Korea change your life, make you a better person, a worse person? And then uh, today, many years later, you're telling me your story. So how did all that change you, having that hardship and then living your life? It made me realize that uh, there's a fine line between living and dying. It also gave me a feeling 
that I did something that was good. We went and defended the people we didn't know. And that group of people now has the eighth largest economy in the world. Our country stands for freedom, and freedom isn't free. And that's one thing that you have to realize, is that our freedom is not free. It's been paid for by other people who have shed their blood for our country and given their lives. Every man that died is sacred to me. Every man in Iraq today who dies is sacred to me. I feel as though my family comes first. My country and my family. If we were to be attacked here in the United States today, I would not feel bad about picking up a rifle and going out and fighting. I think it makes you stronger. You can either go one or two ways. You can either be a survivor or you can just throw in the sponge and quit. You can't do that in your life. No one can. What you have to do is you have to realize, yes, horrors. You saw horrors. You saw people die for a reason, for freedom. Yes, it did change me. It made me realize more so than anything else of what freedom means and also what your family means to you. My children, both my son, both our son and our daughter are precious to me. They're, my daughter-in-law is precious. My son-in-law is precious. My grandsons are precious, all three. And uh, it so happens that our, tho- our son and daughter-in-law adopted a Korean boy for mm-hmm. five months, little Eddie, and they named him after me. And I think that that is wonderful. I cry for them all, love them all. And my wife has been my standard bearer. She's been the one who has taken care of the family and taken care of us through thick and thin and stood behind us. And also the fact is that my belief in in our Lord is the greatest it has ever been. And I think that I've survived for a reason. I've had cancer, and I survived from it. And I think that for some reason, I'm here to help others. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a chaplain, why I accepted the I did the thing of being a chaplain unit. I want to ask you about Korea and in combat. You had medics. Yes. You had chaplains. Yes. Do you remember any times where the chaplains were ministering last rites or talking to the wounded or anything like that? Was a lot of that going on? Oh, yes. you remember anything in particular or a story mm-hmm. or something? Or Captain Smith, uh, Captain Smith, uh, Chaplain Childs, there were uh, other other chaplains who would go ahead and who would... Stay with the wounded. You know, stay with the wounded. And they would take care of them. 
trying to comfort them. They're also wounded who, when you were in the hospital, uh, they even had uh, nurses, all right, nurses, who guys would call and ask for their mothers in the hallucination. And the nurses would come. And they'd say, yeah. You know, they would talk to them as their mothers. Why do you think wounded men would call for their mothers and maybe not their fathers? I think you're close to, you, you know, your dad, your, your, your dad, you always think of someone who's very strong. It's very strong. But I think your mother is the one who nurtures you. And her, you grew up, she was the one who took care of you as you grew up. And that was, and I think that's the reason. I know I felt close to my mother and, and my father. My dad was sick when I was uh, overseas. And, uh, and I sent, every cent that I had, I sent to my mother. All right, except for $10. I kept $10. I kept $10 to go in r and if you can imagine going to R or going to R and R on ten dollars, but I wound up with I wound up with a hundred dollars. <laughs> During the midst of all of this combat, how did you process all that information in your mind at night? When did you think about all this, or or did you just think about it after the war? All the casualties, all the fighting, or did it bother you during your tour there? And then maybe at night was it the worst or? Were there worst parts of all that? When I came home, when I came home, it was a night I couldn't sleep because I would think. It was then, when you're in action, when you're doing something, you don't think that way. You don't think of anything except surviving, except helping, except doing, except working. You don't think of anything like any anything like that. It's on on the way home. Uh, on the way home, when I was aboard ship, on the on the, on the way home, I kept a little marble bag. All right, I kept a little marble bag, and what I did, I dropped little uh, pieces of stone, little stones into the marble bag. Every time we had engagements, I put them on the bag. And, and what I did, I, I sat down on a board ship, and I sat down on, on, the, on, the, uh, you know, on the deck, on the deck, I put my field jacket down, took my marble bag out, undid it, poured all the, pulled all, pulled all the stones out, and I counted the stones, 145 stones. And I put them back in the bag, all right, tied the bag, and walked over to the side of the ship and dropped it in the Pacific Ocean. And I said, it's gone. That was one thing. But the thoughts and the dreams never left me. I still have dreams. If uh, I was I, I was operated on just uh, last Thursday. La last Thursday I came. I, I'm, I'm home a week. All right. Uh, if I get cold, and if uh, they put me under anesthesia, I start talking about Korea. My wife walks me out of it. She talks me out of it by saying, where would you like to be? 
Where would you like to go? Where would you like to walk? You know, the beach, the Outer Banks, places like that. And that's what I, but I never, and I always, I dream, I still dream. I dream about, dream about Husser, I dream about camp, I dream about Stovall, I dream about the different ones. And uh, Henry Schuller, when he died, he died in my arms. And I told him, he asked me if I would tell his parents how he died. He lived in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. I said I would. Wanatek, our sergeant, first sergeant, said, don't do it. He said, don't do it. He said, you're going to be disappointed. Don't do it. So I came home. One of the things is, I said, I swore to him I'd do that. I drove up to Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And And I went to see his parents. His brother threw me out of the house. He was angry. And I, I left. I, that was it. That was it. And this was an experience that I had, and I never would do that again. But I felt as though I had promised him made a promise, and I kept that promise. Frank Camp, fellow that replaced me, we took, at that time, we, at that time we were holding a line. We took fellows up on the, for forward observers. I was supposed to go home. And the night that Day before I, two days before I was going to, going to, was supposed to be rotated, they said that they wanted me to take Frank and several other guys up on a hill. And uh, so I said, you know, I was thinking, then, then is when I thought, hey, wait a minute, I, I've got, I, I'm, I'm going home. Two days, two days, they're going to get me out of here. I'm going to, I'm going to go home. And I thought, well, I've got to take these guys up on a hill. All right. I was scared, more scared then than I was. I thought this could be the end. You know, it could be the end. Very fortunately, we got up there. We, we, we came back. And uh, we did run into a Chinese patrol. We took care of them. And we had three guys wounded. And we brought them back with us. And uh, I was able to go home. I was shaky. Uh. Let me ask you a question. You, you talked about freedom. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran, Ed? The American flag is the most beautiful thing in the world. It'll fly and it'll stay above every flag, every country that there is. The white stands for purity. The red stands for the blood that was shed. And the blue stands for hope. The stars or each of the states that are united. It represents to me the strongest country in the world, the greatest country in the world, a country that will be called on to help other countries with freedom. To us, the flag is waving 
and will wave forever above all things. I marched with the Korean veterans. I have marched with them. We marched. We, we marched in Washington for the dedication of the memorial. We marched. Uh, we've marched in Washington before. We've marched for all the different parades. We marched here in Aberdeen. We marched in uh, Baltimore, and they'll be in the St. Patrick's Day parade. Uh, and. Our guys are 78 years old, 77, 78. We have one who's 82. Uh, and we have, it, it, it means a lot to inside to see, oh glory, wave. And it'll always wave. You'll never be able to take it down. Well said. Um, wh why is Korea referred to as the Forgotten War? It was an unpopular war. It was between World War II, you know, it was Truman's War. They call this Bush's War. They called that Truman's War. Uh, it's forgotten because of the fact that it's between World War II and Vietnam. Vietnam lasted 10 years, okay, forever. It seemed like it was going on forever. And I, 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 really, I felt sorry for every one of those guys. Uh, Vietnam overshadows Korea. You know, they talk about the wall, they talk about this, they talk about that, they always talk about the Vietnam. Uh, Korea was a war that stopped communism in its tracks. It was the first time that somebody drew a line and said, you don't go any further than that. Uh, and Harry Truman did that, right? He was criticized. He was called all kinds of names and whatnot. It was Truman's war. Uh, today's revered as a good president, you know. Back then, it was terrible. He was he was bad. Uh, it's forgotten because you were told. Uh, I I came home. I was discharged at Fort Meade. Uh, I came into Camp Stoneman, California. Uh, they fed us steaks, uh, and I had never hadn't eaten rich food for a long time. I had written, e eaten mostly K rations, most C rations, and things like that, and I threw it up. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, couldn't take it. Uh, we were taught, we were told when we came home, go back to work. Go to your family, and so on. The other thing is, we were told you're released before the war is over. We signed a paper that said we would not discuss any unit where any unit was in the Far East Command, wherever wherever it was. That we were subject to prosecution if we went ahead and we did it. Uh, we were told to just. Assume your normal activities, go home. Uh, so what I did, I went home. And I went back to work. Uh, I went, after I had gone to the, to, to the veterans, I wanted to be uh, analyzed. Should I go back into engineering work? What should I do? And it pointed that way. So I went back to work with Crown Cork Seal, and I went to work for Martins, and I went. And finally, I went to work for Copper's Company, and I worked for them for thirty years. Uh, but that's that, that's what we were told to do, and we kept quiet about it. We didn't make the noise that 
Vietnam guys made or anything like that. We, we were told to just go home. That was it. You, you did your job. You were finished. Thank you. And uh, that was all. Did you ever feel like when you came home that nobody can understand what I've been through? Did you ever think that anybody, did you ever, did you ever try to tell anybody about what you'd been through? Or did you ever have thoughts like, nobody's going to understand what I've been through? And you find yourself alone? Did that happen? or Exactly. Because of the fact that uh, you were away for a while, and people would say, where have you been? <laughs> you know, it was like, like, where have you been? You know, oh, I went to Korea. Oh, that was it. Oh, you know, they didn't want to hear what, what you said. The other thing is, is the fact that you kept the stuff stuffed in you because you didn't want to talk about it. I didn't talk about any of this stuff until 1990. All right, I joined a Korean organization. In 1990, and uh, and around in that time, and I never talked. I never, t never, never, never talked about it. I well, you you read something in the paper here. How did you find out about what I'm doing? Uh, Connie Coleman mm -hmm. to sent me an email and told me what you were doing. Why Why do you think you responded to that? What What was it about? What did you want to do through talking to me? Did you want to tell you tell your story? Just tell my story. Just tell my story. Do you, what, do, you, do you think people are forgetting about Korea or, and or what should people remember about Korea? I think that they should remember that one, it was a country that was, had been devastated by Japan. It was a country that was very poor. It was a country who was going to lose its freedom uh, to the communists. It was a country also that was saved by the United States. And I think that people should remember that. Today, I don't know how many people do remember it. Well, that's why I'm doing this. We're going to let people know about Korea. Yes. You know, um, obviously you're proud to be a Korean War veteran. Yeah. Do people thank you for your service? Uh, yes, they do. How does that make you feel? Oh, it makes you feel good. And you know, it makes you feel better when people thank you that, yes, you did serve. Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. Uh, yes, you did go through a hard time. Yes, you did. You know, and you survived. It makes you feel. It makes you feel good. You know, it makes you feel good to be able to talk to, to youngsters, mm -hmm. and to tell them, you know, what this country means to you. You know, thank the Lord that I'm an American. Thank the Lord that I'm here in the United States, and not in some other country. You know, right or wrong. And we do make mistakes, but it's still our country. And we love it. And you want to defend it no matter what the country asks you to do. It's not what, you know, what, what the country can do for you, it's what you can do for the country that counts. So what I've done I feel as though that I helped in some small portion, just a small portion, to make this country what it is today. And it's sad to me to see what's going on now in the country, which I call my congressman, I call my senator, I call all the different ones and uh, complain, and I even, I have a line uh, to the White House, and uh, I've called, I've called there also, so. Hey, go ahead. All right, we were in Wachon, and uh, the valley, 
We also, we were, at that time, we were making a tactical withdrawal. And I was in or the group that I had. I was a corporal at that time. And what we did, we, we were supposed to hold the, the opening of the valley for three hours while our people retreated. Uh, or made a tactical withdrawal. <laughs> and what happened was, was there were 18 of us. We had several 50 caliber machine guns, a couple of 30 caliber machine guns, and we repulsed the Chinese three times. Uh, it was snowing, and it was bad. It was snowing. And what happened was, was the fact that Colonel Gray had gone out with, they were, had 170 men, they had 170 men, they had gone out. They did not have a password to get back through the line, th th through the line. We were ready to, re to, to, to withdraw, and all of a sudden we saw these fellows coming down across, across an open area. There were about, we counted them, it was about 17 or 18 guys, 17 guys. And what happened was, was they came and they stopped. And they came a little further and they stopped. And I said to Valdivia and Husser and the other fellows, I said, pass it down the line. I said, wait till they get close, very close, and we'll wipe them out. And then we'll leave. In the meantime, I heard a nice tenor voice, and it sang, Jesus loves me, this I know. And I listened, and, I, and, and they came a little bit further, and his tenor voice said, Jesus loves me, this I know. And I stood up and I said, For the Bible tells me so. And he said, let the ones to him belong. And I sang, they are weak, but he is strong. And we sang together, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And I said, there are guys, hold your fire, get them in here. And I uh, saved uh, 17 of them, Colonel Gray. And Valdivia, he said to me, how did you know that song? And I said to him, Fat David, didn't you ever go to Bible school? And that was it. That was it. Great story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. We're done with the interview, but I want to let you know that uh, your story is very amazing. It's very powerful. And uh, I'm glad you made the effort. I'm glad I called you this morning to come at 10 because otherwise, <laughs> what we're doing is we're recording history here. This is, this is history. And this, your story is going to live on many years after you're gone. Teach your legacy. It's going to teach younger kids about what happened in Korea and World War II, and we're going to talk about Vietnam, but this particular documentary. So I want you to take some ownership in that, and I'm proud to have you part of this work now. So this was a very important meeting, and, and one of the answers to, I think, why you survived all these years later. I really do. But I'm going to shut the camera off, but before I do, I'm going to ask you from where you're seated at the end of my interviews. I always like the veteran to give me a salute into the camera. Can you do that when I tell you from where you're seated right there? Sure. Okay. You, you got the hat on, so you're, you're prepared. So. Okay, right into the camera, Ed. Go ahead. Good deal. Okay.